tell us where the kids are. Missing for months. Is JJ safe? These two children from Arizona found buried in Idaho on the property of their mother's new husband, Chad Daybell. I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. Now, their mother, Lori Vallow Daybell, waiving her right to a preliminary hearing after the state of Idaho presented some of their evidence on August 3rd. said that he was uh, being a zombie. We now know what happened to 7-year-old J.J. Vallow and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan, but we're still trying to figure out how and why. This is everything you need to know about the Lori Vallow Daybell case. I'm Katie Wilcox, iTeam executive producer, and joining me is reporter Erica Stapleton. So, Erica, kind of walk us through some of the key players who we've already heard from. Well, there, as you can imagine, are a lot of people involved in this, but one of the key witnesses is a woman named Melanie Gibb. She's a close friend of Chad and Lori's, and it gets to a point where she actually confronts them about JJ. He's been missing and some of the other concerns she has in this case, and she confronted them in a phone call, which she recorded and turned over to police. I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. You just have to have faith, and this is not some sort of master plan. There's no way Lori and I should ever come up with this. We are also just trying to talk to how we got to this point. So why don't you take us back to the beginning to when this all really started to unravel? So back in 2018, Lori is with Tylee and JJ in Arizona and her then husband at the time, Charles Vallow. Tylee is Lori's biological daughter from another marriage, but JJ was adopted by Lori and Charles and JJ was a young child when they adopted him and he has autism and has special needs. So in 2019 though, records show that there was problems with Lori and Charles's marriage. She lost her mind. Uh, I, I, I don't know how else to say it. So what makes her a danger to herself and she to others? She threatened me, murder me, kill me. Then in July 2019, police are called to a home in Chandler for a shooting. And they tell us that Lori's brother, Alex Cox shot and killed Charles Vallow. Police say Cox claimed self-defense at the time of the shooting, but now more than a year later, that's still being investigated. So at this point, it's just Lori, JJ, and Tylee. And she actually moves the kids from Arizona to Idaho in September. And Idaho just happens to be where Chad Daybell lives. Erica, at this point, what is Chad and Lori's relationship and, and how did they meet? Chad and Lori knew each other from back in 2018. They actually met at a gathering. It was a religious gathering. And Chad, what we know now, is a doomsday author and had some of these teachings, a lot of them focused on the ends of time. So the two of them met at a convention in 2018. So Chad and Lori knew each other when she moved there, and they didn't just know each other. We know from witnesses now and from court records that they actually were involved romantically. And this is also when they both have spouses. So keep that in mind. So I want to look at where those kids are once they get into Idaho. We know that Tylee has her GED, so she wasn't enrolled in any high school in Arizona at the time when she moved to Idaho. But JJ was enrolled in school in Gilbert. We know that Lori called them. She actually told them she was moving to California, but in reality, she went to Idaho. We know that JJ was enrolled in school there, but again, he ends up disappearing before he finishes more than a couple weeks at school in Idaho. Uh, at what point is sort of the last time we see these kids? They move there in early September, like September 1st or 2nd, according to court records. And then it's basically just one week later, September 8th, is the last time we see Tylee. And we know this because the FBI put out two pictures, and it shows Lori, Tylee, JJ and their uncle, Alex Cox, Lori's brother, they're at Yellowstone National Park, which is about an hour drive from Rexburg, where they're now living. So we see these photos, we see Tylee, she's holding JJ in the picture. And what we know is that that's the last time Tylee was seen alive. And JJ, we know, was still with his mother for the few more weeks following that. But on September 22nd, that's the last time he's seen what we know now from records and witness testimony. And he actually was absent from that new school he had in Rexburg on the 23rd and on the 24th, we know that Lori called to pull him from classes. Does Lori report them missing? No, she doesn't report them missing and no one really knows they're missing for a couple months. Chad at this point is also married. And in October, mid-October, his wife, Tammy, dies in her sleep. No one thought it was suspicious at the time. It was just a big tragedy. But 
Within days of Tammy dying, Chad and Lori get married. Their father's dead. Now their new stepfather, his wife, has just died. And this is all within a few days of their parents getting married. That must be when the police get involved. You would think so, but not exactly. It actually came down to JJ's grandmother, Kay Woodcock. So remember we said that JJ was adopted. So Kay and her husband, Larry, are actually JJ's biological grandparents. And Kay is Charles Vallow's sister. So they have this grandchild and Charles and Lori adopt him. So that's where Kay comes in the picture. And when Charles died, it became harder and harder for Kay and Larry to get a hold of Lori so they could talk to JJ. And in September, when Lori left, they lost contact with her. They couldn't reach her at all. So they start to worry and they reach out to police in Arizona where they still think the family is living and ask for help because they just haven't heard from JJ. So how do they figure out where JJ is? Eventually, investigators kind of piece it together and they track Lori down in Rexburg, Idaho. So Idaho detectives go to her house where she's staying and they ask where JJ is and Lori actually tells them that JJ is with her friend Melanie Gibb. Remember, the one that testified, we talked about her earlier. Lori told them that she was, or that JJ was with Melanie Gibb in Arizona. Essentially, Lori is asking her close friend to lie to police about the whereabouts of her child that, from what all we know now, had been missing for about two months. She asked me just to pick up my phone and take a picture, a random picture of kids running around, take a picture of random kids to make it look like it was JJ. So you lied to a police officer, is that correct? Correct. Meanwhile, while they're having that conversation, where are Chad and Lori? Chad and Lori, what we know now, they wouldn't tell Melanie where they were over the phone. They were seemingly in hiding, but they are back in Hawaii and there are no kids in sight. They are seemingly just going about their normal daily lives. So it's super weird to see this, but then things get even weirder. On December 11th, so after Lori and Chad are in Hawaii, Alex Cox suddenly dies at his home in Gilbert. But when he died, um, you know, he was still being investigated for Charles's shooting, but that wasn't the only shooting that he was being looked at for. We're gonna bring in a couple new people and they're part of the family and they will ultimately be part of this case. So Lori has a niece in Arizona, also named Melanie. Her name is Melanie Pulowski. And back in October, 2019, Melanie was having some problems with her ex-husband, Brandon Boudreau. They were involved in this bitter custody battle. And we know that Melanie and Lori were super close and that Melanie even followed some of the same teachings that Lori had when it came to Chad Daybell. So in early October, Brandon Boudreau, her ex-husband calls 911. And where's your emergency? Someone just shot my window. And what he tells them is that he thinks Alex Cox is the one who pulled the trigger. About a month later, Melanie is moving up to Rexburg, which we know where Chad and Lori and Alex are all living. And Melanie actually remarries while she's there. And it's her new husband, Ian Pulowski, that actually gives us a first dose of some of the dark religious beliefs that are at the center of this case. It seems like the investigators think that Melanie Pulowski, right, Lori's niece, might know something about the kids. I know you got to talk to Melanie. What did she tell you? She denied knowing anything about the kids. Lori had told me that they were getting lots of threats and she had to do everything she could to keep Tylee and JJ safe. Did you ask her specifically where they were? Tylee would, would go to school or um, you know stay with friends. She had a plan for JJ to put him in a good school and to have a nanny for him and she was setting everything up for them and I had no reason to believe that any harm had been done to the children. Lori had her plan and uh, I trusted that. Of course her new husband Ian is hearing all of this and there are definitely some red flags. There's no question about that. So he's called in to the Rexburg Police Department and the FBI are there and they ask him, hey, can you record any of this? We think your wife might know something. We're trying to you know, get some answers here. And he agrees to do it. Although later it's something that I believe he regrets. But when police look at his computer, they actually find a document 
that comes up in court and it sheds light on some of the really dark beliefs that Chad was seemingly teaching both Lori and Melanie and Melanie Gibb and all these people that were kind of involved in that inner circle. And these beliefs, I want to warn you, are just very disturbing. And the document actually says at one point that Lori suggested that JJ and Tylee were zombies that might need to die. For those, you know, following it, it might seem excruciating because you're like, what's what's happening here? There's all these dark beliefs. There are spouses that are dead. But Rexburg police are on the trail. They ultimately track Chad and Lori to Hawaii and and ultimately out of Idaho. She is given um, an order to produce her children within five days. This is in January. By the end of January, she doesn't do it. The five days come and go and nothing happens. We kind of sit and wait until the end of February when Lori is arrested in Hawaii. And this is where I remember, you know, having conversations in the newsroom and just feeling exactly like you were describing. What's going on here? Well, this is where we really start to see, you know, the magnitude of this case. We were up in Idaho for that hearing. It was right before the pandemic really hit. So we were able to travel and there was a line of people waiting to get into the courtroom. So the town of Rexburg, the surrounding area, people were wearing t-shirts, people had signs, where are the children? You could hear people yelling, where are the kids outside? So this is something, you know, it's gained national attention, but imagine being in that community where you don't know where two of your own children are. But at this point, Lori's not saying anything. So take us up to June. So in June, and I know between March when Lori is ultimately booked in jail, in June, that's a long time. So. All the while, investigators are building their case. We know now that they've been pulling cell phone records, doing things like this. And it's so ultimately it was phone records from Alex Cox that brought investigators back to the Daybell property. And it was pings from his cell phone the day after each child disappeared. Those were the locations that corresponded where they ultimately found the bodies. They found two bodies on the property that were later confirmed to be JJ and Tylee. And I want to explain how they were found because I think it all will ultimately speak to some things down the road because it's just horrible. Very, very gruesome. So they found JJ in a pond or by a pond. He was wrapped in plastic bags covered in duct tape. And we learned in testimony from Chad's hearing that he was wearing his red pajamas. And then Tylee is you know, her situation was not much better. Parts of her were found burned and charred, and she was actually buried in a pet cemetery where there were other animals being buried. So this all coming out in court documents, and it's an absolute gut punch to anyone that was following this case, especially their family members. You're who holding on to that little strain of hope, and this you, <laughs> you're still involved. holding on to it, even when you hear the news. I'm sad, I'm heartbroken, I'm confused. They were, they were killed. This, you know, children don't die and get buried like that. So, you know, where are the murder charges? They're not here yet. And I think there's a reason for that and hard to comprehend why something like this would happen. But Chad was arrested that day, not for murder charges, but he was arrested for concealing evidence and for conspiracy. And we later learned that the two co-conspirators in that are Alex Cox and Lori Vallow, his wife. So. A lot to unpack with that, but ultimately there are no murder charges because there's still pieces of the puzzle that they're trying to put together. Melanie Gibb comes back into this, and again, this is why she's such a key witness because she has so many ties to this and can weigh in on the dark religious beliefs and what she saw and testify to Chad and Lori's relationship. So she fills in a lot of the blanks that we had in the beginning. I saw him as the hand and her as the puppet on that hand. But she was with Lori and Chad and Alex Cox the week leading up to JJ's disappearance. She and her boyfriend went out to visit in Rexburg. Dincy Tiley didn't, you know, ask much questions about or ask many questions about that, but they did see JJ. So JJ is there on the weekend, but the night of the 22nd, Melanie tells us she's with her boyfriend, she's with Lori, they're actually recording a podcast of their own, and it's later in the evening, and they see Alex Cox bring JJ into Lori's apartment and put him to bed, or bring him into Lori's room where he would normally sleep. So they see this happen, and then the following morning, they didn't see JJ. 
didn't have reason to, you know, think otherwise, but Lori did tell them, and this is both Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend testifying that Lori said that, you know, JJ was behaving badly. She said that he was climbing on the fridge, climbing on cabinets, that he knocked down a picture of Christ and that she actually sent him to go stay with Alex. So we have two witnesses now that are placing JJ with Alex the night that he disappeared. And then we have word that Alex was with him the following morning. And at that point, no one had seen JJ since. What are some of those sort of last things that people are still asking when you talk to any, anyone following the case? I think the biggest thing is why I think that's the biggest thing. And that's the biggest frustration is that these are two innocent children. And, you know, as you start to peel back the layers of this, you know, horrible case, you start to see that you start to question, you know, Tammy's death and Charles Vallow's death and Alex Cox's death. So there's all these dead people that are connected to this one couple. And they're the ones who can really unlock a lot of these questions that people have, and they're not saying anything. So it's unbelievably frustrating to, you know, see them sitting in jail. These are the only people that can seemingly answer the questions that everyone wants to know. And they're the two people that will ultimately be held responsible for what happens. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for your reporting. I don't know if we'll get to answer why, and we'll continue covering this as this trial or the next steps happen. 